Hello, David Hoffman, independent documentary filmmaker here in my studio where I just got a million views. That's the gold thing. And I've done thousands of interviews, but few as good as the interview I did back in 2003 with Mark Benioff, the CEO, co-founder of Salesforce.com. It's an incredible look at the history of the internet as he saw it then, the 2003 era, and what he thought was going to happen in the future. When I first saw the internet and really understood the power of the internet, it was probably 94 or 95, and as I started to think about what would be the potential, where could this go, how will this evolve, um, I got so confused and felt it was so difficult to really perceive it all, I went to the big island of Hawaii, I rented a house on the ocean, and I stayed there. And after about two months of just thinking about this, I made a purchase, which surprises everybody. Why would I make a purchase from the Big Island of Hawaii? But I bought a URL, you know, a universal record locator for the internet, you know, like the name of something, www. And what I bought was www.you.com, u.com. Because after thinking about everything, about where the internet should go and how it should evolve, it was that seminal moment in May of 96 that I said, what everybody's going to want is you.com. That is exactly what it is for them. Their life as a website or as a service delivered heterogeneously to wherever they are in the world, whatever language they speak, whatever currency they use, whatever device they have in their pocket or in their hand, and, but totally personalized exactly for them. And I think it's that ultimate realization, that is, a very mature network, a very sophisticated set of fourth and fifth generational multidimensional matrix services, and appliances that don't look anything like what we use today to access the network, ultimately giving us this concept of you, that the network is your mirror that in the same way you go into your bathroom in the morning and you see yourself, that is what the network will be to you. And that is you.com. And that is a big step forward from where we are today. There were a lot of prophecies for the internet without calling it the internet. Uh, it was called the information superhighway. It was called interactive television. It was called set-top boxes. It was called video servers. Uh, the French called it Minitel. There were a lot of w different ways that people called the internet, and there were a lot of predictions, a lot of conferences, but very few people actually were able to say, oh, here it is. It was this network being used by scientists and government agencies that would have this nice, uh, relatively simple graphical user interface developed by this uh, kid at a university and with some other research that was done in Europe and uh, behold the internet and it would begin to fulfill the promise and what was the promise the promise was the rebirth of alexandria that was the library of alexandria was the last time all of the information in the world was in one place and now it is reassembling vis-a-vis -vis this network and that is what's exciting about uh, the internet. It's, it's easy to make, I would say, these kind of subjective predictions about technology in the future. It's hard to make the specific prediction of exactly what is going to happen where. That's why I think a lot of people got it very wrong. We didn't realize that it would be this commodity network that would change everything. So it's important to look at kind of technology as an evolution and in our industry, always, 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 and I guess if there is one kind of really salient point that I would try to get across, people, and that's consumers, businesses, analysts, always overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in 10 years. And that also is true with the internet. It was true with the personal computer before it. It was true with the mini computer before that. It was true with the mainframe. It's really true with a lot of things that people come along and make these big promises. Oh, the whole world is going to change. Everything's going to change. 
and then it doesn't change, and then people are wondering why is it not changing, and then people get into a mode of kind of talking about, oh, it'll never change, and then all of a sudden it has changed, you know? And that is because you have to let the cake bake. And that's true in our industry, that's true in every industry, but it's really true with the internet. And I think a lot of people were rushing things, and uh, they had the vision, they had the idea, they knew it was possible. Um, a lot of companies were looking for their next uh, source of revenue, big companies. And um, a good example was SGI. You know, I'm, a lot of people don't remember now SGI. Uh, but SGI and Sun at the time were, were very much uh, uh, similar companies, similar sized companies. SGI was really trying to get what we call kind of the second curve. That is, the first curve is kind of what you start your company in. And then all entrepreneurs and CEOs are making sure that they're going to ride the second curve. A lot of companies never are able to ride the second curve. A good example is DEC. If we were doing this interview maybe 10 to 12 years ago, Digital Equipment Corporation was the second largest computer company in the world. Uh, they started on the mini computer. Uh, they had the VAX VMS operating system. Their a chief executive was Ken Olson. And when the PC emerged and Michael Dell was down in Austin, Texas, and he quit his, quit his uh, college education to start his company, Ken Olson said, a, a personal computer, you know, who would want one of those? You know, why would you want one in your home? Why would you want one in your business? He, he couldn't see that that would be potentially his second curve. And um, that is, that is, that's the reality that we live in in, in uh, our tech industry. We're, Things are always changing. We have a, the concept of impermanence, that things will never be this, as they are. Things are always changing. That life is very frail and fragile, like sand going through an hourglass. That is the technology industry. The technology industry is a manifestation of that concept of impermanence. Nothing that is modern today will be modern two or three years from now. All the computers, all of the networks, all of the capability, the software, the hardware, everything is changing. So you have to move with the change. You have to get ready to go with the change all the time. Well, if you look at the history of technology, just in the last maybe 25 years or something like that, I would, you know, I would go back to 1977, the founding of Microsoft. 1977, the founding of Oracle. Um, 1980, the founding of Sun Microsystems. Um, this was kind of a very seminal, tough, fertile time in the valley. Exciting things were happening uh, here. Um, it was the birth of the mini computer, but it was also the birth of the microprocessor. It was the birth of the microcomputer. And you saw that the potential that had been demonstrated by IBM and by Sperry and Univac and that would later become Unisys, right? And a lot of the mainframe companies, what you saw was that there was a tremendous potential for computing, but who would actually benefit from it? It would have to have two things, a greater level of commoditization, a greater level of democracy. Computers still were for the very rich, right? And for the very few. And there was a beginning of an understanding that we wanted to open this up, break through it. These were also the time of the game manufacturers, Atari, uh, the Commodore 64. It was the time Apple I was going to become Apple II. So we're right at the beginning of computers, of PCs, of, um, we weren't calling them appliances yet. There was nothing in our pockets, right? Um, there was nothing on our desks, really. Some people had terminals, but still very few people had terminals. They were, and if they did have terminals, they were either VT100 terminals or they were profs terminals. Profs at the time was basically it was an IBM terminal to a mainframe. So this was a big shift that was about to happen over the next 25 years from basically very centralized computing to then we would go into a phase of decentralized computing known as client-server computing. PCs, you'd soon be able to find that you could hook them together and that you could create something called a client-server architecture. Client-server architecture was one PC would basically be almost like a master, the other PC would be the slave, but if you put enough of them together, you could begin to almost build your own mini-computer, your own mainframe computer. 
That was very interesting. Uh, that was a, a big revelation that the network was important. It was the first time that we really saw the power of the network. In, in the 80s, every year was the year of the land, they would call it the year of the land. The land meant the local area network. It was the network that you put these PCs together. And as the year of the land became the, basically the decade of the land, because that's what it took, just like in all paradigm shifts, this decade of the land evolved so that you could begin to buy networks of PCs instead of buying many computers instead of buying mainframes. What did we see when we saw these lands emerge? We saw the power of the network itself. Uh, Ray Norda began to talk about that. Sun began to talk about that. Sun rewrote their tagline, the network is the computer. Uh, that was very visionary. Maybe that even was an early prophecy so that Sun would be successful in the internet itself. So as we saw the power of being able to have one computer talking to another computer, or one computer that was a server or the ability to be a um, distributor of information to many different computers, then we said, what if that computer wasn't in our company? What if it was a public computer? What if it had different kinds of data on it, not just relational data like tables or spreadsheets, but what if it had video on it? What if it had graphics on it? What if it had audio and sound and this kind of thing? And then what if that server wasn't just in your company, but it was on a public network where lots of different heterogeneous devices, all different makers, shapes, and sounds could all talk to the same computer. And that was the transition point. That's when we started to really move from the late 80s and the, the beginning of client-server computing and the maturation of client-server computing, which started really as we kind of moved into the um, early 90s and into the mid-90s, right about that time, we began to prototype public networks, public systems, okay? And that's really what the internet was. It was the concept of a public computing network that is taking the power that we were experiencing inside our companies, okay, like client-server computing, but we could do something really incredible, and that was we could distribute this into households or into people who are mobile. That was an incredible breakthrough in consciousness because then we began to see that cable boxes shouldn't just be able to receive cable signals, but they should be able to receive network signals. We wouldn't know that it would be IP at that point, for example. So I was gonna say IP signals or TCP IP signals, but the networks were still proprietary at that point in the, in the early 90s. Their, Novell had their network, Microsoft had their network, IBM had their network. The concept that everyone was running on the same kind of a network standard had not yet manifested. So in that early 90s period is when we started to see the early companies emerge, appliance companies, consumer-oriented companies, people leaving some of the traditional PC manufacturers and many computer manufacturers and network providers and saying, I'm gonna build the consumed, real consumer computer. Oh, that's not the consumer computer. I'm building the real consumer. Oh, this is gonna go in your pocket. Oh, you're gonna use a wand. Oh, you're gonna write on it. You're gonna do, nobody can type. You know, these were the big breakthroughs that everybody was having. So then you have to say, what happened? And what happened was, is all this research and development was happening in very robust servers to be able to distribute all this information, video, audio, text, et cetera, and tremendous amount of consciousness and research and development and excitement around the client device. A lot of companies that people don't remember anymore like General Magic and Go, well, Go went, right? But they were the um, indication that something big was going to come. And that was that computing was going to evolve and evolve from a place for mostly nerds, mostly for high-end business professionals and that computing would become for everybody uh, to become a true democracy, that computing would become a commodity, that information itself would not be held by those very rich and very elitist, but that information would be flowing like water would be flowing, like electricity would be flowing, and behold the network, behold the internet, that it became the last of the modern networks. What other net modern networks did we have before that? We had water, we had power, we had sanitation, we had cable, we had telephony, right? 
So when we started our business here on Market Street and the Embarcadero in San Francisco, we did not dig a well for our water. We did not install a nuclear power plant here in Justin Herman Plaza. We did not put in our own telephone system. We did not have to put in our own cable TV set-top boxes, etc. What did we do? We just called the utility providers. They turned us on when we pay our bills by the month. Well, there's another network that we also installed. We installed the internet. We plugged it into the side of the building, and in came information. And then we bought various devices from a lot of different manufacturers and were able to receive this information without actually installing very much at all. In fact, some of the information even came in wirelessly through wireless internet called Wi-Fi. So that's a big shift, right, that the internet became the last of the modern networks. The internet became the way to receive information as a commodity through a fully democratic system available to everyone and that it would radically change everything, that the internet would fully disintermediate the world, every industry, every government across the board, that the, this concept of people are empowered now at a level that they've never been empowered before. And that's what we have right now. If you go back and you look at what happened in the mid to late 80s to the mid to late 90s, the mainframe computing suppliers were disintermediated. That is, they were put out of business by the PC manufacturers and by the network suppliers. Uh, what was the message? It was a twofold message. Okay? The message was this is an order of magnitude lower cost than your mainframe and an order of magnitude ease of use, okay? But the functionality was still there that you needed. And in some cases, you have more functionality. So vendors would come in, like the vendor I worked at, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, other vendors, uh, like uh, PeopleSoft, SAP, would come in to a corporation, into a company, and they would say, you don't need your mainframe. You can throw away the previous generation of hardware, throw away your mainframe, throw away your enterprise applications from companies like Cullinet, MSA, McCormick and Dodge. These were the last generation of big enterprise software companies. Today in the Valley, people don't even remember that there were enterprise application companies be before PeopleSoft, SAP, Oracle, etc. They don't even remember it. But only 10 years ago, companies did not run on PeopleSoft. PeopleSoft was only one year old. SAP was not a major player in the applications business, okay? Um, Siebel Systems did not even yet exist. So we have a very short attention span in the Valley. The reason these companies were successful is because they provided value at a level that was much cheaper, much easier to use than the mainframe. So client server, behold client server computing, behold the success of client server computing, behold the rise of the kings of that era. But there is a new era that's happening. But how can there be a new era? We are, have this a tremendous value. How can there be a new era? Well, things are moving again. Things are changing again. How could that be? Well, there's a paradigm shift. And again, this paradigm is an order of magnitude cheaper than client server computing and an order of magnitude easier to use and that is what creates a paradigm shift in our industry. Whenever those two things come together and there's that big of a shift. So now what's happening is these companies are getting disintermediated. They were used to be the ones who got eaten. Now they're, they're being eaten. So they're no longer the eaters. They're the food. And what's happening is that companies can realize for the first time, and individuals too, that they can do things much cheaper and much lower cost than ever before, much easier. So the power of that idea, the power that the internet could be the game changer, the power that this isn't about software as a service or web services or any of these kind of uh, buzzwords or we have, to put, we have to name everything in the valley to make it important, okay? But the only thing that's important to the end user, to the customer is value. Are they getting more now with this new paradigm than they got with the previous paradigm? 
and that's what's happening. Behold, these companies who are coming now along and saying, hey, you can run your business at 10% of the price that you could with the previous suppliers. No software to install, no hardware to install, nobody to hire, and we provide you the services right over the network. Well, this is a huge shift. It's very symmetrical with when I was working for Oracle and I would go into somebody's office and I would say, you don't have to buy a mainframe. You don't have to buy all the, you don't have to hire all these COBOL programmers. We've done all the work for you. We have, have packaged applications. We have a relational database. But now we say, you don't need packaged applications and you don't need a relational database. You just need a service that provides all that to you. That is, you can receive over the network the services you need to run your business, to run your life. That's a huge shift. If you look and you read the Bible, um, you read a, no, this is not an exact quote, but it kind of goes something like this, that man was created in the image of God. That basically there's an aspect of God in every man. Well, you could also apply that going down one step farther between man and technology. The technology is a manifestation of man. But not just a manifestation of man, but technology is a manifestation of consciousness. That is, from the first creation of the wheel to where we are today with the internet, it's really an example of how we think about the world that we live in. Man has not changed that much. We have not evolved that much, right, over the last 100,000 years or whatever it is. But technology has changed a lot. We can get in an airplane and go across the world. We can make a phone call. And now we can learn anything about anything. That, that's a big shift. That's, that's like the shift that's saying the world is not flat. The world is round. That there is a solar system. That we are part of a system of planets. Um, when you have consciousness, when you have awareness, when you are able to see things that previously you were not able to see, it alters your ability to um, deal with the world uh, that you are in. And perhaps the internet is doing that more than anything else. Um, the internet lets us find out what is happening in every part of the world. Uh, and we are able to read every newspaper every minute of every day if we want to. That's a pretty big change. Uh, the last time that that really existed when there was only one newspaper. <laughs> now there is millions of newspapers, and if you want to read them all, you can. You can have access to any information anywhere, any place, any time, on any device. Now, that's a big idea. And how does that impact us? Well, is that impacting us, or did we impact that? You see, did we create that? Is that already who we were? Or is it feeding back the other way? I would suggest to you that it's really what we created because it's more of a reflection of who we are. The internet is the way it is, is a fully distributed system with lots of distributed nodes and lots of um, uh, cap a lot of processing power, different kinds of computers all connected together. You could say a lot about human beings also, the way our level of interconnectedness or now maybe our level of interconnectedness or our awareness of our level of interconnectedness. And so as you get that, and as you can see kind of more of the way the world is, what you get is there is no control. There is no proprietariness. Okay? There, is a, there is a level of democracy and a level of freedom that is an essential part of every human being, and that is now reflected in the technology that we use. And not just the technology that we use, but the information and the way that we use it. Now we are fully empowered at a level never before to take charge of our own destinies. We can do things that previously we were not able to do. Not just small business able to use technology that was only available to large business, individuals having access to data, medical records, research that previously was not available, but everybody has an, a relatively equal level of empowerment when you're on the internet because everybody's essentially a peer. So that provides a huge change. You know, in, if you look at the software service model, all the time 
um, people will come to us and say, well, wait, I'm a big company like General Electric. I can't, you know, uh, I, I, you can't expect me to use the same software as this person who only has five people in their company, but why not? R really, it's the same features and functions are required if you're a salesman with General Electric or if you're a salesman in a five-person company. You want to know the name of the person you're selling to and what you're selling to them and you want to have access to the information on what you're selling to them, et cetera. Essentially, it's the same job function. It needs the same level of automation. The only thing that's different is the scale. But the internet resolves that because what the internet says is that you can build systems with infinite scale. Look at Amazon.com. Look at Google. Look at Yahoo. Right? These, co these companies demonstrate that there's, you can apply this scale to any problem. Big, big companies, small companies, individuals. That there's a democracy. So Amazon.com runs retail operations for some of the biggest companies in the world. Amazon.com runs retail operations for some of the smallest companies in the world. Amazon.com delivers a democracy in retail. Whether you are a big company or whether you're a small company, you are crazy not to use Amazon.com as the way you sell products. That's just the way it is. Or eBay is another example. If you have a huge company, a huge computer company or whatever, and you want to sell a lot of product, use eBay. But if you're a little tiny company or even an individual, use eBay. Well, what does that say? And what it says is the internet is this kind of great uh, equalizer. Because when you log on, the internet cannot figure out, you know, if you are a company that has, you know, huge, you know, tens of billions of dollars of revenue, or if you're just, uh, you know, a small businessman with a million dollars of revenue or a hundred thousand dollars of revenue. And that's the potential of the network to provide this level of equanimity. So if I was to ask you today, here we are, it's 2003, and I was to say, okay, here we are sitting here in the heart of Silicon Valley, Who's the biggest e-commerce software manufacturer in the world today? Is it SAP, who will sell $2.3 billion of all kinds of business software? Is it Microsoft, the biggest software company in the world? Do they sell the most e-commerce software? Is it Oracle? Is it PeopleSoft? Is it Siebel Systems? Who is it that will sell the most amount of e-commerce software in the world? I mean, collectively, those companies have probably invested five to ten billion dollars in the development of e-commerce software, that is, the ability to conduct transactions over the network? The answer is none of them. The largest supplier of e-commerce software in the world today is a race-off between Amazon.com and eBay. Amazon.com and eBay both run more transactions and automate more stores and do more in e-commerce than all of those e-commerce software companies combined. They got disintermediated, destroyed by the paradigm shift of the internet. That is what the internet can do is take this function, but instead of basically everybody having to buy a computer and everybody having to set up a store and everybody having to plug into the credit card systems and all that, we're able to share. We're able to get this concept of sharing, that we can share Amazon's computer. We can share eBay's computer. We can share other service providers on the network. That's a big idea. Sharing. See, it's not about control. It's not about proprietariness. Where you get this breakthrough, it's about sharing. Also, it happens to be great for the environment. You don't have all these computers going into landfills and everyone's not plugged into the electric grid. We're all sharing off of one server run by this provider. That's a big change. If you go into a CIO today, in many companies, a CIO may say this to you, IT is our competitive advantage. That is, information technology is the way that we're going to differentiate from our competitor. And what's interesting about that is, I could understand that at a company here like Salesforce.com, or at another high technology company, that IT is the way that we actually do differentiate strategically. But it isn't very rare at all that I go into a company who sells magazines or newspapers or tennis shoes or sells cookies and cakes 
and I meet a CIO and he says, let me tell you something. IT is how we differentiate here at XYZ Cookie Company, you know, XYZ Magazine Company, XYZ Apparel Company. That's crazy. Do they really think that their financial systems or their customer management systems are so much better than another provider that that's how they're going to really differentiate? I don't think so. I think it's going to get down to your core competency. C.K. Prahalad has said, and you know, a company that focuses on their core competency and outsources everything that is not in that core competency is the company that's going to dominate their market. And over time, that has been true, that the leaders who are really strong in their areas of expertise are the ones who are going to deliver the best product and own their market. So then why wouldn't you try to choose a commodity provider of information technology? Do you ever go into a, an office of a company and they s say, it's the quality of the electricity that we're manufacturing, we're setting up this hydroelectric dam, that's going to make our company the greatest. The quality of the water we're pumping out of our well, that is going to be the key differentiator of our product. It doesn't happen, right? The fundamental way that you succeed is by excellent leadership focused on your product, by your, on, your, on your own core competency. Outsource everything else. Now you can with the internet. So if you really start to look out at the future about what's going to happen 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, the first thing that's going to be really dominant in our lives is the network. Now the network is going to evolve and permeate and change a lot over the next 50 years. Nothing about the network that exists today will be similar. It will be, of course, higher speed. It will, of course, be more reliable. It will be more available. Uh, it will be more wireless. It will be more persistent everywhere than ever before. You, you won't have to worry about being disconnected when you get in an airplane or go to some remote part of the world. The network will be a persistent part of our lives. And it will be that way with quality and as a commodity. And this, this is very important because this will be the foundation of how everything else will be delivered. Um, after you have the network, there will be a, another generation and another generation and another generation, um, five, six, seven generations of the services that are available in the network today. Not just the kind of directory services that we see with Google today, the commerce services that we've talked about, the search services, the news services, the business services. These will have evolved. Um, to be much more richer, much deeper. Um, the data will be much, um, uh, much easier to retrieve and to uh, look at and to evaluate. Uh, anybody will be able to get to anything very, very easily, very, very simply. Um, I think almost to the level that people will have to be aware of who sees what, when, because so much will be available to so many. And if the first component of that is the network, if the second component of that is the services, then the third component of that kind of has to be how you're going to access it. Today, people wear things on their belts, or they have things that they have in their pockets. Uh, they have things on their desks. These kind of appliances or these kinds of uh, access points will really change and be much more of a uh, transient commodity than it is today. Today, people today feel like they have to own, oh, this is my uh, computer, this is my phone, this is whatever. But the level of authentication and the things that will happen will allow us to go up to any device and it will know who you are and what you have the ability to access. And that is going to be a, a very significant shift because it will greatly expand the market for all of these different de devices. You could imagine that you could walk up to a device, there'd be some kind of a biometric authentication that is it, it knows it's you because of 
the unique way your heart beats or the unique fingerprint on your hand or your, the, the cornea of your eye or whatever it is, it authenticates you, it, 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 it identifies what you are able to then go after on the network. Uh, it tells you how your business is doing. It tells you how your life is doing, what's going on maybe even inside your body itself. And these are, these are, big, sh these are big shifts. And as you make your way through the day, from your business to your home to out with your friends, et cetera, the network is with you and it is essentially becomes almost your companion. And uh, it uh, helps you to achieve a greater level of actualization of your own life. Oh, yes. Superbly good. Yeah. Okay, great. This is what you needed? Yes. Okay, great.